Okay, uh, welcome back, everyone. <clears throat> okay, so um, in chapter six, we titled What Leads a Person to Repentance. We looked at four simple reasons. One um, is goodness of God leads to repentance. Uh, the works and miracles of God leads to repentance. And godly sorrow leads to repentance, and finally, God grants repentance. Right? It's it's like His gracious gift. Uh, in the Passion Translation, it says God's gracious gift of repentance has been made available to those who are in need and whoever is willing to repent. Okay. Um, you know, as as a continuation from that chapter, it, it concluded with this Luke chapter fifteen verse seventeen. Uh, it's talking about the prodigal son, right? Um, Luke chapter 15, verse 17, it says, But when he came to himself, he said, Okay, so when did he come to himself? No. So, you know the story, we all know the story of the prodigal son. Um, so it was at the time when he was hungry and then he was feeding the uh, the pigs, and then he was about to eat uh, yeah, full pigs' food. He came to a realization. That's what it means when he came to himself. That's what it is. Uh, that he, When he came to the realization, he said to himself, even the servants in my father's house eat better. And then he makes the long journey back home. Okay, now, you know, we... Uh, it is very important in that story to know that yes, the father ran, but the father ran to the gate. The son had to come home first. Father didn't go where the son was. <laughs> right? You know, he he took his stuff. Son decided to take his, uh, you know, riches and whatnot, God's uh, father's belongings, and he went and lived a lavish lifestyle, sinful lifestyle. Uh, but then he came to a realization, um, right? And I think in many ways that God's goodness is taken for granted that way. You know, he's, oh, God is good, uh, you know, so I can do whatever I want to do and all of that. But uh, it's always very important for us to remember that uh, if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us, okay? So the first step, to recovery and restoration is repentance. The first step to recovery and restoration is repentance. All right. Um, all right. Let's look at chapter seven. So, when and how do we repent? Now that we know it's important, we've established uh, in many points that repentance is important. When and how do we? Repent. Okay. Um, it, to very simply kind of paraphrase this chapter, it, one point says keep short accounts. That means as soon as you do something wrong or as soon as you know something is wrong, repent. Don't wait for it to you know, just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, and then you can repent. But then it is advisable and suggested that as soon as you know that something is wrong, repent. Okay, when that's answering the when. Okay, so sometimes correction can come as we read the word or listen to the word being shared in some way. That means repentance can come when you're reading the word, right? As uh, Nikhil mentioned, or when someone's preaching, uh, you get convicted and then you decide to give, right? Uh, the point is don't let your hearts be stone. Okay, don't let your heart be stone. That's, that's basically the, is the point. So keep short accounts. As soon as you know something is wrong, turn towards God. Okay, um, in Matthew 13, 15, it says, for the hearts of his people have grown dull. So uh, please pay attention to the choice of words, okay? For the hearts of this people have grown dull. That means 
their love for God has kind of fainted. Okay, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Okay, so repentance happens when we simply say yes to the correction that God brings. Repentance happens when we simply say yes to the correction that God brings. And see the last line of that verse in Matthew 13, 15 says, understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. You see how the word heal is used with repentance. Right. How is healing associated with the repentance? It's interesting. Do you remember this chapter in a verse in uh, Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen? I think it says, "You will know it if I start quoting it." If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves. <laughs> and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and heal their land. Very nice, the Prince. <laughs> okay, if my people and this people who are called by his name, you see the progression there. People who are called by his name, his people, children of God, will humble themselves right, and turn from their wicked ways or repent, turn from their wicked ways or repent 180 degrees, right? Then I will hear from heaven and then I will heal their land. It's amazing how a group of people God's chosen people, if they would repent, God is willing to heal the whole land. Abraham interceding. If you find 50, will you spare the city? That city could have had 500 people. But if God found 50 righteous, he would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah. And then there's negotiation that's happening. 40, 10, no. So the power of repentance as individuals and as a collective is emphasized over here, right? When and how do we repent? Um, okay, repent as soon as possible uh, when it is uh, when the matter is still fresh. Okay. All right. Uh, let's move on. Um, the process of repentance. Okay. Uh, can someone take the mic and read Second uh, Corinthians uh, chapter seven, verse eight to twelve, please? Excuse me. In chapter 8, yeah. Second Corinthians chapter 7, reading from. Your mic is on, right? Yeah. Okay. Verse 8. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry through only for a while. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorry led to repentance. For you are made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produced death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourself, what indication, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things, you proved yourself to be clear in these matters. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I, do, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, for the sake of him who suffered wrong. 
but for that our care for you in sight of god might appear to you okay awesome thank you right so the, this is the process of repentance this chapter uh, as i mentioned even in the previous chapter we looked at only two verses from second corinthians chapter 7 right uh, and how paul is being appreciative of the church in corinth that they turned from their wicked ways because in his first letter he was very harsh uh, to the people in Corinth. And then that's what he's saying, right? If I made you sorry with my letter, <laughs> I do not regret it, though I did regret it. He's like, okay, Paul, what are you trying to say now? Paul, did you regret or not? No, that's. And then he's like, okay, that's not the point. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry. That means it convicted you, right? It, 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 it made you realize that something is off here. I hope you guys see it. Right? That's what Paul is saying. Though only for a while. And verse 9, now I rejoice. I rejoice that not you were made sorry. Like, not that I made you feel bad. Not that you felt bad. I'm not rejoicing in that. But I'm rejoicing that your sorrow led to repentance. He's rejoicing in that fact. Isn't it? And that's why we have the scriptures like, okay, the, all of heaven rejoices. When one sinner repents, there's a rejoicing that happens because he's not, not he or she just didn't feel bad or sorry, but that sorry, godly sorrow led to repentance, right? And they're, now their life is saved. So continuing, for you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Verse 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. Okay. Now, uh, what we are going to look at... The important points here is from in verse 11. Okay, I want you to pay attention, guys, and see the progression there is. Okay, now we're talking about the process of repentance. Okay, the process of repentance. Now we know that repentance is the first step to recovery and restoration. Okay, but there are sub steps that in repentance, what is happening? For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things, you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. In all of those points, diligence, clearing of yourselves, indignation, fear, desire, zeal, and vindication. And you have cleared yourself in all of these points. And so now it's elaborated just with different words under repentance. You see diligence, what is it? It simply means you are earnest, very serious, very careful. If I tell you, Francis, you know, if I talk about you to Arnold, this is like Francis is a very diligent person. Have you heard? Everyone say that, right? Okay, you know, like Prince or Sri Radha is, she's a very diligent person. That means whatever responsibility I give her, she does it earnestly. She does it with utmost care, right? With very seriously. Okay, send the lyrics. Yes, I will send the lyrics. Very earnestly. You say how you think I don't listen to the conversations, but <laughs> so that's diligence, right? That means the church in Corinth or the people in the church of Corinth were earnest. They took Paul's letter very seriously. They didn't say like, ah, okay, another letter from Paul. You know, let's make a rocket out of it. You know, <laughs> let's uh, let's make a rocket out of it and just fly it. You know, no. Um, that means it also shows that. They realized that it was uh, Paul was writing with the insp inspired uh, the Holy Spirit that it was the Word of God, right? And they took it seriously and they started working on it very diligently, very earnestly, right? And that leading to clearing of yourselves. What does that mean? Eagerness to do what is right. That means they began to think differently, and because they start to think differently, their actions were different. Act, right? That's what it is. To do what is right. To do is what? Doing is an action. It's a verb. 
right? That's what Christian life is. So cl diligence, clearing of yourself, that means living a righteous life. Indignation means displeasure, wrath against sin. So let's go back to that verse. Uh, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation. That means displeasure or wrath against sin. That means they began to hate sin. Okay, Fear, fear of God. And vehement desire or a holy longing or a serious purpose. A holy longing. Right? This is holy fear or is this holy zeal let my zeal for the house of god consumes me you remember that that verse right my zeal for the house of god consumes me that means you are consumed with this holy fear of god it's filled your heart it's overflowing and all of that, Paul is telling to the church of Corinth that you guys have cleared your name in all of these five parameters. And I, I'm just reminded of this um, story, a real story, of a very famous evangelist in the late 80s, 1998, 99, right? Very famous, very huge ministry. I'm not going to name it, obviously. Um, when I say popular and big, big. He was very powerful in the way that he ministered and you know very well known evangelist and and there were certain accusations that was made and then there came a time where he was caught red handed uh with a prostitute and then you know his church and ministry was so big and people loved him uh you know they and then there was this huge scene in the church of him crying and uh, repenting and all the drama happened. And uh, and fast forward, two years later, he was again caught with the same act. Uh, so, we have to be very careful. Right? We're going to look at it in just a bit, uh, but um, in the seriousness of repentance or our understanding of what repentance is, like, have you made diligent effort? Or is there someone on your team who you, who you know has been going, going through a hard time and uh, have they repented? And when you ask that question, are they being diligent? Are they earnest? Are they are they are they serious in their repentance? Right? How is their desire? Are they consumed now with the love of God, with the holy fear of God? You need to ask all of this question. Are you following? Right? Second Corinthians chapter seven is a wonderful, wonderful passage when it comes to the context of uh, or the topic of repentance. Okay, so you have repentance there, and then you have recovery. Um, zeal and vindication, passion for God and his devo and devotion against towards Him. Zeal and a passion for God. Uh, I don't necessarily like the word passion because uh, it's <laughs> it is uh, yeah I just don't necessarily like the word passion. So, but the original meaning of the word passion means long suffering. In its original language, means long suffering that's what passion really means so the the good friday week the the, the week that jesus enters jerusalem right, and that whole week is called as a passion week it's not like oh i'm full of passion i'm gonna die on the cross it's not like that it's long suffering that every day that he long suffered he endured that's what it is he endurance is what patience uh, what passion is um, you know, when I was in music college, uh, we had we used to go through uh, interviews, uh, interviewing students who have applied for music college, and uh, and one of the obvious questions would be, why do you want to join? Why do you want to do this degree in music? And the most standard response, ninety percent of the time, would be what? I'm very passionate about music. 
Okay. And in one month, that passion disappears. Yeah, so because see, the, what happens is, uh, so they come with an understanding of a very generic view of music. Okay, music is amazing. It's like you know, uh, drums and all of this. But it's a three. It's a three. Now it's a four-year degree in music. Four years. That means you are going to learn about things that you don't necessarily want to know about music. Right, there are so many subjects. Okay, you're going to learn music history. You're going to learn counterpoint. That means melody against melody. You're going to learn form and analysis. How to analyze the music that Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, and all wrote. Okay, that's not. Those are all not subjects that excites people. Or in my, you know, it's like it excites me. But you know, orchestration. How to write a melody? Take a melody, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Okay, and write an entire piece of music for an orchestra. Uh, ah, I don't want to learn all that. So, so all of that, when it becomes a little challenging, passion drops. But passion is really what it means is endurance, long suffering. Right? Run this race with endurance. Yeah. Run this race with endurance. Be faithful at it. And so recovery is pointing that out, saying, OK, you're saying that you're filled with zeal. And we are going to see how long is your suffering. right? Love is long suffering, it says, isn't it? Uh, are you filled? Are you going to endure this race? Are you, you know, It's interesting that passage doesn't say how you start the race. Yeah. Anything that Bible says is just wonderful. You have to ask yourself. It's starting, okay, how you end the race or finish the race. It talks about that, but not about the starting. Right, that as uh, young leaders uh, you know, in this classroom and then leaders online, it's very important for us to ask this question. You, you, whatever it is, you want to put it in a, make a frame of it, keep it in your, in front of your mirror, whatever it is, you know, Finish the race faithfully. Finish the race faithfully. That has to be ringing in our ears. And that, that will show your zeal for God. right? And this is definitely for me as well, like, you know, as I'm sharing this. So, so recovery and restoration. Proved yourself to be clear. Restoration. Yeah, yes. Holy long. Yes. Uh, holy longing is, uh, yeah, longing to be holy and also and continuing to live in, in the life of holiness. That's what it is. Um, you know, uh, John the Baptist is a perfect example of zeal for God. That um, He was a Nazarite. Uh, he was a Nazarite from birth, right? Uh, he was set apart. That's what... So Nazarites were radically set apart to be holy. Um, and then he was the voice in the desert wilderness crying out. Right? Again, Take, borrowing the prophecy from Isaiah. Um, and his voice drew people to the wilderness. Uh, right? And then his lifestyle was the life of a ho a holy, yeah, holiness. So repentance, recovery, restoration. You see, restoration is the last thing. Uh, and you know, we know that God is our restorer. Yes or no? Right? Our God restores. And we know in, from the scriptures, everything that the enemy stole, and he would restore in two folds or what, what not, hundred folds, etc. Right? And I personally, you know, this is just my understanding that God takes extra pride in restoration. Right? When all hope is lost, when everything seems to be impossible, then he's like, okay. Let me show you what I can do. You, even human beings, for that matter, in any profession, especially in terms of restoring something, you take a broken bike to a mechanic, and he says, "Like you know, like, don't worry, I can fix it." What is he doing? Restore it. And once it's restored, it's like you know how you bought it. You see how it is. You take a broken watch to a watch repair, you know, person who repairs watches. They say, yeah, I can fix that. Nothing is too difficult. And there's this uh, very famous uh, pottery kind of a thing in Japanese, you know, that uh, in Japan, where, you know, all these broken vessels or 
pottery thing is being fixed with gold. Right? And so, but to come to that place, for me to get the bikes, bike restored, I have to take the bike and go to the mechanic. No. Yes. Okay, so that's what it is. So uh, recovery and restoration. Okay, let's look at some more points. Practical matters um, on how we can repent and live a restored lifestyle. <clears throat> Living with repentance toward God's God always. Living with vigilance on all sides. First Peter 5, 8 and 9, it says, be vigilant, be sober. Okay, saying, don't be influenced by other voices or the world, but be sober, be vigilant. Living with boundaries in all matters. Very important point. Living with boundaries. Okay, um, as ministers, um, so, you know, we've discussed this. Uh, I used to speak with uh, the youth, you know, uh, especially when they talk about relationships. Um, <clears throat> again, they don't want to hear this. It's very unpopular. Boundaries, uh, boundaries, you know. You know, I said, guys, have boundaries. Okay, so you, this is all live, uh, real examples. Okay, okay, you like a girl? Okay, you're considering a girl? Fine. As long as it's a girl, it's fine. You know, nowadays, so it's like you know. Then, okay, if you're not sure, don't invest in each other too much emotionally. What happens is, and it's the age, you know, it's everything is burning, full of zeal, and you know, it's like all the juices are pumping towards the brains, you know. And then I said, okay, guys, put a boundary, don't message beyond a certain time, like 8 p.m., stop it. What happens is we are wired in such a way that beyond 8 p.m. and 9 p.m., all very emotional and sentimental topics begin to crop up. Like, hey, what should we name our kids? Hey, you know, where should where do you want to have your our wedding? You know, you're not even considered. Now, not even being serious about all the relationships. But you see how the conversation has gone somewhere else. What is happening is that you are investing emotionally in one another, right? And so there's no proper boundary. No, this is just an example of a one of the boundaries that's very important. To as minister or as a pastor, uh, even with my core team members, as a youth pastor or you know core team members, uh, with the women in the team, I will not respond. I will not message them or ask them to uh, to give me a file or something, with, even work related, beyond a certain time. And I've made it very clear with them as well. You don't message. I won't message you. You won't. Don't message me. Okay, unless it's like someone is. Like, you know, in a really bad shape or there's an emergency, right? What is that? That's a boundary. or that, And I'm setting a standard and a value or a principle for that matter, right? And if uh, if uh, it's not... So if I have to, you know, give a, a drop or a lift to women from the... You know, that, uh, there's a lot of events that happens. You know, we have to carpool sometimes, right? And if... And what boundaries do I set in that cases? If 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 there is a woman uh, who wants to meet with me, right? See, one of the things that we need to remember is that in being this, having this holy fear and whatnot, it is also very important that I don't develop this aversion towards women, right? This uh, I don't know what you want to call. It's like oh, women, oh, oh, oh Jesus, Jesus, you know, holy, 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 you know, no, you know. <laughs> Like, oh, no, no, please. No, Jesus ministered to women. Yes or no? So I need to remember I am their pastor as well. Right? And so, having said that, I will meet with them one on one only in church office. Right? It's, I'm creating a safe space for all of us. Right? So, everybody in church knows where I am, who I'm meeting with. Right? And that, even in that, after a certain meeting, now if I know a person, of the opposite sex needs a help, right? Professional help. So I will not carry that forward more than two meetings. I will lead them to a, 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 a female counselor. Okay, I think you know they can handle help you from there on, and they will keep me posted about whatever it is. So what am I doing? I'm creating, setting boundaries. 
you know it's 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 always good to be safe isn't it uh, and so and that boundaries might look different to different people so you set your boundaries right and and be careful so living with boundaries in all matters um living with transparency uh, before those who matter living with transparency uh, if you have a mentor be transparent uh, even with one another right with one another i cannot emphasize this enough don't wear a mask not this surgical mask but you know don't wear a mask that means don't pretend to be someone who you are not it, you understood don't pretend to be someone who you are not uh you know be like whom jesus has called us to be in being yourself be authentic let people accept you for who you are if they don't accept you so be it types because if you are wearing a mask okay the very famous statement of the world is this the world will say fake it till you make it fake means be a fake like you know fake it till you make it that means you know be a fake person until you become a famous person but i cannot stress on this point enough uh be transparent be authentic uh, with one, among one another you know uh the, my wife knows my laptop password my phone password uh everything welcome to uh, you know it's it's always there that, not that she does that but it's there if she wants to do that it's transparent i have nothing to hide right she can go through any conversation she wants to again it's not that she she will or she does that but it's there and she knows that are you with me and so and that that creates a sense of freedom guys a crisis is like i don't know is like I, otherwise you're constantly living this way like oh, you let me create one tough password you know you're const in this like, why why all the tension be transparent live like jesus did if he if, if you're doing that you don't have you have nothing to worry okay all right let's move on living with humility before those we serve living with him i don't think we need to speak a lot about humility we've spoken a lot about it <laughs> okay if there's nothing you remember uh you know but if you can remember this point on humility you are on the right track in your life okay um so be accountable to the people that we serve um at the bottom of page 24 in the pdfs uh in chapter 9 the importance of repentance now we've established the importance of repentance so i'm not going through all those points here um but it says if we remain quick to repent we enjoy these positive outcomes if we are quick to repent we enjoy these positive outcomes what are they repentance brings us into a place where we can believe repentance positions us to receive encounter and experience the kingdom of god repentance is the part of our ongoing transformation into christ likeness so you see that it is an ongoing thing it's not a one off thing repentance is important to stay in the continual fellowship with god repentance brings recovery leading to restoration it's beautiful right i'm sure we've all been on the journey i have been on the journey uh from repentance to being restored it's the it's a wonderful place to be at it's It, it, the sense of freedom that it brings is unbelievable right um and there's a call uh, in chapter 10 we know that uh, again we've established this point where in revelation that uh, the letters to uh, to repent is addressed to the churches itself isn't it and so that's mentioned over there so there is sometimes the call for repentance is not just for individual it's also for to a collective as a to a church right um so you remember this point that paul writes to corinthians he says don't you know that you are uh, your body is the temple of the holy ghost you remember that right and so most of the time we take that point as for an individual and say and then say okay you have to live a holy life because your body is the temple of the holy ghost but we forget that paul is actually writing that to the entire church of corinth 
right? And so the whole church is uh, there's an invitation to live a repent uh, uh, to repent, right? Because there is a call to repentance, and and that's the end of chapter eleven is that there is a call to repent. Okay. Um, in conclusion of chapter eleven, in Luke chapter thirteen, was one to five. Can someone read that quickly, please? Okay. Luke chapter thirteen was one to five. It's in the notes there. There were present at that reason some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate has mingled with their sacrifice. And Jesus answered and said to them, "Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans, because they offered such things? I tell you, no." But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen on whom the tower is Siloam yeah, fell and, and killed, them. killed them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Okay, so there are two instances that's happening. There are a bunch of people who killed or who died because of a cruel leader. Okay, Pilate. Okay, that's one thing. And then second is a natural disaster where a tower falls and kills people. Now, instead of Jesus explaining why this happened, he's saying, okay, you know, uh, you think those who escaped were not better people than those who lost their lives. Instead of explaining the why this happened, he is saying, repent. Simply to say that if you are alive, that means you have the opportunity to repent. In Acts chapter seventeen, verse thirty, says, "Now God commands all men everywhere to repent." So everyone who is alive have the opportunity to repent. The invitation remains, and so all the days of our life, uh, you know, this life repentance should become our lifestyle. As uh, Justin also mentioned, are you guys with me? So this is the whole huge topic on re repentance, recovery, and restoration. Jesus preached it. John the Baptist preached it. It was for the Jews and the Gentiles. It is also for the church. Right? And in the middle, there are all these practical aspects on how, when, um, to repent. All right. Um, so next class, we will look at the last section, section uh, three, on overcoming the flesh. Okay? All right. Uh, well, I hope this uh, class was helpful today in understanding. I know there was a lot of content, uh, a lot of scriptures, uh, but I hope you could follow it. And uh, just pray about it. Go through these verses again um, and, um, and let it minister to you. All right? Great. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. God bless you. I'll see you next week. Bye.